Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part two of our talk on gastric malignancies. We left off last time, we were speaking about what the potential differential diagnosis would be for gastric adenocarcinoma. And typical things we think about would be lymphoma, gist tumors, perhaps metastasis, gastritis, H. pylori infection, and a number of other possibilities. So let's look at some of the tumor possibilities. Gastric lymphoma. The most frequent GI site of malignant lymphoma is indeed the stomach. It's still, however, a small percent, under 5% of gastric malignancies. Most are non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Primary gastric Hodgkin's disease is extremely rare. There are many risk factors for primary GI lymphoma, including celiac disease, HIV, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, immunosuppression are all possibilities. Patients with celiac disease have a 200-fold increased risk of developing intestinal lymphoma. Although it's not quite the same numbers for gastric cancer, there, of course, is an increased risk. When we think about gastric lymphoma, there are CT patterns from a polypoid mass to diffuse infiltration to ulcerative lesions to mucosal nodularity. Now, it's interesting. In the old days, we used to separate gastric adenocarcinoma from lymphoma, by saying that if a mass was over 5 cm, it was lymphoma. But now with CT, we pick up things much earlier, and the overlap, particularly early between lymphoma and gastric adenocarcinoma, is high. We talk about lymphoma typically being more diffuse. We talk about lymphoma typically having a greater amount of nodes, particularly nodes be be below the level of the renal hilum. However, we know that the findings do overlap. If you have an infiltrating tumor in the stomach that goes into duodenum, it's more likely lymphoma. I mentioned larger nodes can be seen with lymphoma, but I showed you some cases before that showed very large nodes in gastric cancer. And perigastric fat planes are more likely to be preserved, but I guess that might help if you have a bulky tumor. Now, malt lymphoma, a mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue, is a low-grade lymphoma, commonly associated with H. pylori infection, very much like adenocarcinoma. The most frequent CT finding is wall thickening, but not bulky wall thickening, and these are the ones that are particularly common to look very much like gastric adenocarcinoma. So here's a patient with abdominal pain. I thought this was an adenocarcinoma. Infiltration of the antrum may be going into duodenum. The involvement potentially of the duodenum should make you think about lymphoma, but that was kind of borderline. This really looked like primary cancer of the stomach. There really is, at best, minimal adenopathy. Here it is in the coronal view. Again, very much looks like the adenocarcinomas I showed you before. There's the infiltration. But this was lymphoma. Here it is on the cinematic. A great example of showing you why adenocarcinoma and lymphoma can look very similar. In this case, you would know it's a neoplasm, but only an endoscopy could you make the right diagnosis. And here's a few good looks with cinematic rendering showing you the infiltration. Again, one of the things we're looking at with cinematic rendering is tissue mapping. You can see very nicely here the differential between mucosa and submucosa showing you tumor extent. Another patient, this patient presented with GI bleeding, there's definitely an infiltrating tumor in the stomach. There's some nodes present in the periodic region, but again, I probably would have favored adenocarcinoma, which I did favor, and this ended up being lymphoma. On the other hand, this case, the tumor infiltration is bulkier. There's lots of nodes. Yes, you could consider adenocarcinoma, but lymphoma is a good possibility. We think about ulcers as being something with adenocarcinoma, but you can see ulcerations with lymphoma as well as with just tumors. And again, the bulky tumor infiltration should at least make you think about that possibility. Now, the third tumor is just tumor, and it's something we're seeing more frequently now. We're seeing more just tumors of the small bowel, more just tumors of the stomach. Two thirds of just tumors arise in the stomach. About a third occur in the small bowel, but just tumors can occur anywhere from the esophagus to the anal region. They arise from a common precursor cell, display spindle cell type characteristics. They're CD117 protein positive, CD34 protein positive, 
NS100 and Desmond positive, though that's less frequent. They make up about 2.5% of gastric tumors. Between 10 and 30% are malignant. Malignancy typically increases with size. Over 5 cm, they're typically always considered malignant. But I have to admit, when the uh, pathologist reads the report, when there's small lesions, they say it's a GIST tumor. We don't see signs of malignancy, but you can't exclude it. Watch carefully. And that's maybe a good way of thinking about GIST tumors in general. In the stomach, the classic is an exogastric mass, but they also can be endogastric. Ulcerations are very common. They at times can be homogeneous, but when they're malignant just, they're often inhomogeneous with central necrosis. When they spread, the spread is commonly to the liver. You can get cystic liver mets. You also can see spread to the omentum or adenopathy. Here's two diagrams, the one on your left, an intraluminal gist tumor, the one on your right, a more classic exophytic gist tumor. Now, gist tumors can be small, look like lyomyomas. Here's a two centimeter lesion, very well defined and smooth. These will typically be resected. Here's another one. Again, this case also emphasizes the importance of gastric distension here with water that allows you to see the patient's tumor very nicely shown with volume rendering and with MIP as well. Here's another example of a lesion that's both in the lumen and exophytic. So sometimes you have these lesions which sit on the border, but again, in terms of differential diagnosis, I don't think you're gonna have much difficulty. There really aren't many choices as to what this can be. So that becomes very important. This is gonna be a GIST tumor. Here's another example, some endoluminal component, exophytic component, you can see that there's different variables in terms of enhancement. They're usually not hypervascular. We see hypervascular lesions with small bowel gist tumors. In the stomach, there can be some vascularity, but it's not very significant. The lesions can be, particularly when they're smaller, homogeneous, as in this case. And just a very nice example showing you the tumor and showing you it's sitting in and out of the gastric wall. Just a very nice demo. Another example, this is probably the largest tumor I've seen with endoluminal components. Again, what else could you think about? A GIST tumor, it's not a look of an adenocarcinoma, it's not a look of lymphoma. I guess I could consider metastasis. That would be exceedingly rare. I've seen one metastatic renal cell look like this. But when you see this appearance, a big exophytic lesion, intraluminal hanging down, that's going to be a gastric gist tumor. But I will admit that's an uncommon presentation. Here's another example. Here's another case with the component both intraluminal and exophytic. Again, I'm showing you a number of cases. It's interesting when we have new fellows every year, they're shocked at how many gist tumors we see and they're shocked at the appearance. So I like to show people the appearances. Here it is with cinematic rendering. This was an interesting case because this was referred to endocrinology. It was referred to our adrenal conference as a large adrenal carcinoma. It's actually, it could be an adrenal carcinoma. I will admit on a non contrast scans, this could be adrenal. It could be pancreas. But this was actually a mass coming off the stomach. This was a GIST tumor. You can see the adrenal gland on the image on your right. But it makes the point how tricky GIST tumors can be because... It almost looks sometimes like they're simply touching the stomach rather than arising from the stomach. And it's really only after you've seen a bunch of these do you really get a good feel of that. So it's really nicely shown here. Again, the various components of the patient's tumor. You can see it really nicely here. You can see it here when we look at the cinematic the large textural changes, the large component of the tumor. You can see it very nicely, the appearance. Here you can see it's nicely exophytic. Here's another example. This is a large mass coming off the stomach. Again, it's an exophytic tumor. There isn't much in terms of differential diagnosis. At times, the coronals and sagittals can be very helpful to you in really looking at these tumors. Here's another example, large exophytic component, but in this case, you can see this direct invasion of the spleen. There's also an ulceration, there's some bleeding in it. 
it makes a good point to look at the exophytic nature of these tumors and look for adjacent organ involvement. Here's another one, subtle splenic involvement, large exophytic component, modeled enhancement, areas of necrosis, some areas of calcification. Gastric gist tumors can calcify. I'm going to show you in a moment a few examples with very dense calcification. That's not written up very much, but it's something to be aware of. Here's another one as a patient presenting as a GI bleed. You can see some of the enhancement within the lesion, large exophytic component, tumor necrosis, bulky tumor, not very tricky. But again, coronal views very nicely show you how the lesion sits against the stomach. These patients are treated with Gleevec and do fairly well. They then will get surgery. This case shows the tumor to be fairly vascular with areas of central necrosis. Here it is going from MIP to volume rendering. I mentioned before these tumors can become ulcerating. Here is a large necrotic gist tumor, almost simulates an abscess. Most of the gist tumors I see are homogeneous, but these areas of necrosis are not uncommon. And it's something to be aware of when you think about the various appearances of gist tumors. Just very, very nicely shown in this example. Here's just some 3D reconstructions, and here's some cinematic renderings. And I really like showing you the cinematic because you really get a better feel in this case that it's truly coming off the patient's stomach. Now I mentioned gist tumors can calcify. Here's an exophytic lesion which is almost totally calcified. In fact, at first glance you might think it's outside of the stomach but it's really in the gastric wall showing you a beautiful example of a calcified gist tumor. A few more images of that. And here's another case. This lesion was initially thought to be a pancreatic mass, maybe a neuroendocrine tumor. At times, the way the tumors sit off the stomach, they can really simulate tail of pancreas tumors. This case was having calcification. You could see the interface to stomach well here. And again, this case really does make the point that at times it is tricky separating a gastric gist tumor from a pancreatic tail lesion. So it can be very tricky. It's something to be aware of and just a very, very nice example. I mentioned before when gist tumors spread, they commonly go to stomach. Here's a good example, or from stomach to liver. Here's a good example of local spread, right? You can see the spread on the omentum. You can see the nodularity almost a carcinomatosis type pattern. I mentioned that gist tumors will give you cystic metastasis in the liver. Now, in terms of pitfalls, I showed you a case a moment ago with calcification in the tumor and it simulated a pancreatic mass. Here's another patient who was referred to pancreatic can cancer conference. And you could see why at first glance it looks like a lesion of the pancreas. But when you look carefully, it's really the pancreas compressed and this lesion is coming off the stomach. A very nice gist tumor. Here it is with cinematic, which can be helpful in defining the origin of the tumor. Here's another case where, again, this was also read as maybe a serous cyst adenoma, maybe a spen tumor. In fact, it was a younger patient, so it's thought to be a spen tumor. And I have to admit, on these images, that's what it looks like to me as well. But... When you look at the images more carefully, it's still difficult. But this was resected, and this was a spent tumor. So sometimes it can be very tricky. Now, what can look like a gist tumor? Well, this was a case that I thought was a gist tumor. Large exophytic mass may be ulcerating. This was a liposarcoma that contained no fat, invaded the stomach, and looked very much like a gist tumor. So sometimes large retroperitoneal masses involving the stomach can fool you. That's just gonna happen. There's no way around it. This has modeled appearances, but we show gist tumors that can have modeled appearances. This is very large, but I have many gist tumors that literally hang down into the pelvis. Now there are other tumors that we need to think about that are less common. One of them is a carcinoid tumor. Carcinoids are vascular, and in fact, when you look at this, you see nodes that are vascular. The differential might be a neuroendocrine tumor, maybe a renal cell metastasis to the stomach, or even a glomus tumor. There are different varieties of carcinoid tumors. 
Uh, type 3 is usually a solitary hypervascular tumor that arises from the submucosa. That's the most common. They do have malignant potential and can get liver metastasis. And here's just a nice example showing you that with gastric carcinoid tumors, you can see the liver lesions, but you can see the tumor is only a centimeter. There it is right there. Vascular gastric lesion. As we said, there aren't that many things. Glomus tumors, and I'll show you an example in a moment. Metastatic renal, the kidneys look great. So again, a gastric carcinoid tumor is what you want to be thinking about in this case. The coronal view is very helpful, showing you the lesion sitting on the greater uh, curvature of the stomach. Very nicely shown. And here's just a few more images showing the tumor, including on a sagittal view. Now, carcinoid tumors of the gastric antrum are always going to be vascular or hypervascular, and that's true in any part of the stomach. They're hypervascular. This was a nice mass in the antrum. Because it's vascular, you thought about a neuroendocrine tumor, and in fact, this was a carcinoid. Just a beautiful example. And here's that same case with cinematic rendering. Right there, very nicely shown. And here's a patient with multiple gastric carcinoid tumors, multiple polypoid lesions that are enhancing. Just a beautiful example. Look at the folds. Look at those polypoid lesions shown. The sagittal view is particularly good. I think Honorek published this case in uh, radiology. Just a really, really nice example showing you the multiple polypoid lesions that are present in this patient with multiple gastric uh, tumors. Now, patients with gastrinomas commonly will develop carcinoid tumors in the stomach. Look at the thickening of the stomach here. The stomach is infiltrated by multiple lobular masses that are enhancing. Look at the lesions extending in the patient's duodenum. There's a mass in the head of the pancreas. What a wonderful, wonderful case. Now, this is not a case of polyposis, simple polyposis. The stomach is carpeted by lesions, but they're vascular. And this is classic for a syndromic type pattern. Beautifully shown. Here it is on the volume rendering. Here it is on the cinematic rendering. Just really nice examples. Also showing you the increased vascularity of these tumors. Now, there are other vascular tumors, and I think what I'm going to do is, well, let me go through. I'll show you this one just be in the interest of time, perhaps, because it's short. Here's a vascular lesion in the stomach, which could be a carcinoid tumor, could be metastatic renal cell, but this was a glomus tumor. Glomus tumors are rare, but they're vascular, and you could see them very nicely here. Here was a nice uh, endoluminal view of that. Now, I mentioned METs to the stomach can present as polypoid lesions. That's uncommon, but metastases are very important. But let's see. Let's take a break first, and let's come back with part three of this talk, speaking about the stomach. See you in a couple minutes. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.